suppose the connection that we dug from under in Perth, apart from that. Um, so the first site um, is Perth Theatre. I'm sure most of you, well, many of you are familiar with Perth, but just in case, um, the theatre occupies a plot that runs between the High Street and Mill Street, um, and it's sort of in the northwest corner of the medieval town, really. Um, and what we were actually looking at uh, is this. Um, those of you that do know Perth will have noticed the construction work going on on this site in Mill, Mill Street for quite a long time. Um, I think it's 2015 we were there. Um, and we've only just finished the watching brief. Uh, but this, these are called the Red Rooms, uh, which were the rehearsal rooms for um, Perth Theatre. Um, and they were being knocked down um, and rebuilt. So that's why we were there. Um, and there were four trenches to begin with. Oh, that's just to show you. It's just near the council office. Whoa! Stop it! <laughs> Very badly behaved presentation. Right. Um, this this is the site layout. So we had four trenches to begin with, and then we added a, a fifth. Um, so there was one in the car park at the, at the north end, which is actually on Mill Street. Um, the red rooms don't actually go all the way down to the high street. Uh, they're sort of at the back, so they're more on Mill Street. Um, so trench one in the car park, and then three trenches uh, evenly spaced in the building, and then we stuck another one in. Um, it remained standing, the building, throughout the dig, um, which was quite interesting, quite an interesting environment to, to dig in. It was a bit like being in an exhibition, because um, the lights were still on, uh, people could come in and look at us. It's sort of like going to a museum or something. Um, but at least we were dry. Um, so, um, yes, the original plan was to, to do the evaluation and then demolish the building and open up a traditional al fresco <coughs> dig, uh, assuming we got something, which we did assume. Um, but it was quickly realised we couldn't do that because the building had parallel uh, ground beams made of pretty chunky concrete, which was totally wrecked everything when they were dug up. So we had to keep the thing up. And so as a compromise, the evalu evaluation trenches magically transformed into excavation trenches and was slightly expanded, but not very much because it wasn't very much room. Um, so uh, background, well, we've just been talking about the, the high street excavations so of Martin Spencer in the rear of boots. Um, we knew from those that we could expect organic deposits Medieval bodies generally maybe five meters thick. It's pretty thick. Um, there have been some monitoring on the site uh, in the 80s, which has suggested maybe about two meters deep, um, mostly sort of garden soil type stuff. Um, the key thing, really, for our dig um, that the earlier excavations showed was uh, the base of a, a large ditch which ran roughly parallel with Mill Street. So if you hold that thought for a moment. Um, so I'll just go through the trenches. Do you know that? Um, this is trench one. Um, and as we were expecting, uh, there was a bit of demolition stuff, and we went through that. And then we started going through garden soil, and more garden soil, and more garden soil. And after about 1.2 meters, we had to step it in. So we need shoring, and more garden soil, and more garden soil. Right down to the bottom. So that was interesting. <laughs> well, hang on a minute, there's, there's something at the bottom. And, uh, yeah, it's a bit better than that. Um, this is the edge of the cart that we picked up, um, which uh, just cut into the natural, really. Uh, about 2.3 metres below the ground surface, so quite, quite deep down. Um, and what it's turned out to be, we think, is um, either the west terminal, or perhaps a south terminal, but a large linear feature, a ditch. So we think we might have caught the end of that ditch that was, that was picked up in the earlier excavation. Um, so it was all worth it. Um, anyway, inside, inside. Um, thoughtfully the theatre people, uh, when they put up the red rooms, had taken off a metre of golden soil for us, on this stretch anyway. It was in a sort of sunken pit thing. So that's helpful. Um, so we could expect to make rapid progress. Um, well, 
we went through a lot of garden soil. Um, <laughs> but then right down at the bottom, um, we got that. Um, we've actually basically got two slots for it, but it's, it was a big ditch, very clear this time. It's about three and a half meters wide, and maybe one and a half meters deep below the base of the garden soil. Um, and it had quite a steep, you know, vertical key slip, more of a step west slip. Um, we couldn't fully excavate this way because we thought the trench falling on our heads would spoil the thing. Um, so we, we couldn't get right up to it, but we managed to very carefully get, get the full width. And we also found um, that there was um, there were several floors on this side, quite a lot of door and stuff. Um, just on the top of the ditch and extending out over it, so suggesting later use of the land. The ditch itself had, or well, most of the fills had tip lines from one side or the other, in some cases both. Um, you can see that there's some stones sticking outside there. There's quite a lot of tumbled stone in the middle. Um, and where are we now? Oh yes. Um, yeah, there was some silting at the base, and uh, as you might expect, it had been standing open for a while, but then it seems to have been deliberately backfilled and then used for something else, something else to be put on top of it. Now, I think three and a half metres is a bit too wide um, for just a burgage plot or simple property boundary. So we could have an earlier defensive line, possibly, um, of the, in this case, the west edge of Perth prior to uh, the, the better documented 14th century defences. Uh, and in the bottom fills, we were getting some um, Scottish <coughs> British wear, which does go back to about the 12th century. So I th I, what we seem to have is an earlier phase of, of Perth's development when Perth was slightly smaller. Um, so, so that was nice. What do we do next? Well, then, we went, oh, you can, oh, whoops, I'll show you that again. It's just <coughs> sensitive. Um, yeah, there's more of the ditch profile. Uh, there's sort of interesting scoops going on in places that maybe they were using some of the natural material or something. Um, anyway. Could the lights go down a little bit more, please? I don't know, could they? Looks like we might be able to. Oh, right, there you go. Yes! <laughs> well, you say that. Anyway. Um, so, this is Trench 3, um, which was in the middle part of the building. Um, and it was back up again, the, the, the sunken pit uh, had, had disappeared. Um, but in this one, um, which we couldn't actually make as long as we wanted because the, the pesky digger had to get all the way in, we couldn't walk it. So it's quite a short trench, but um, we almost immediately found a pit with uh, these two rather nice, substantially intact redware vessels, which um, are late 50th, early 16th, uh, probably early 16th um, century. And we're sitting in a little pit on top of a ooh, little stone line drain. And you can see this is sort of a rough floor. Um, which actually went right across the trench. Um, and cut into the, the floor, or possibly set into the floor, um, was a pit. Um, now, there's actually two pits there. I, I won't spoil the surprise too much. There's, a, there's an upper pit, which shows up on the darker stone. Um, and that's 30 meter wide in base. Um, and the fill, um, Quite a lot of lumps of iron um, and slag and charcoal and ash and stuff like that. Um, so some sort of industrial waste disposal, probably. Um, if it's not stretching reality too much, um, the 1860 OS map showed that the incorporation of hammermen uh, were quite close to the site. Uh, hammermen arranged different crafts, mostly metal smiths. <coughs> and actually, a, a minute's an account of what goes back to 1518, so maybe we can look them up. Um, 
but it's the sort of thing that they might have liked to do. So it's quite nice to find it so close to their headquarters. Um, and then below that bit is another bit, um, which went all the way down into the natural, was cut into the natural, very steep sides, um, very ashy fill, um, well, almost like an ashy lining of, of the edges. Uh, and actually quite a lot of, of iron in it as well. Um, now, it could just be this sort of disposal kit again, but the size of the steep side, one possibility we've thought about is, um, is a slag pit furnace. Um, you, know, you have vegetation on the top of it, and for the, the smelt is on the top, and the slag and the iron drop down through vegetation pit, which could account for there not being any in situ burning at that level. Um, just a word of caution, that, that type of furnace was already archaic by the, mid, the later Middle Ages, but then again, just because something's archaic doesn't mean it's not used. Um, so it could be. Um, so anyway, um, Below the, oh, and at the top of top end of it, there's a stone sticking out there, which is near the top. There's actually a, quite a large um, sandstone slab and a sort of path accessing the pit, presumably. Um, below all that, we've got these series of, of um, pebbles and, and silt um, forming a kind of banded, series of banded layers um, going down pretty much to the base, and there's some charcoal and burnt clay. There's also this interesting vertical slot. Um, you can see there's some slumping in there. It looks like planking has been taken out, possibly to uh, allow the pit to be dug. Um, let's see if you can. You see the banding there? I don't know who that idiot is. Draping himself all over the archaeology. That's me, that's me with a, an earlier beard. Um, God, slumping. Um, you can see the banding there. Um, so, it looks like there may have been some sort of reveting going on at the side of um, possibly paths. But across, extending across the trench, now you see where the, where the, the one I'm pointing on there, you can't see it. Um, just here, it's actually banked up sand. So it looks, and there's this sort of trample way, it looks like we've possibly got <coughs> banking there. The sending cut through by this laser pit. So we've got banking and so back to the, the slot. Do you want a laser pointer? Um, no, I'll use my. Oh, I'll use my finger. Um, no, never mind. Um, uh, It's also seamless. Yeah, so we've got the banking material, we've got this, the plank. So also possibly we've got a bank and a path alongside it and retaining wooden structure. Um, at the other side of the trench, just at the bottom, we've got a very thin sort of silt deposit which looked like it was probably the edge of the big ditch again. Um, Unfortunately, we couldn't extend the trench anymore for safety reasons, but it looks like we got the full line of this thing going all the way through the site. Um, so we've got an earlier probably defensive, or at least um, demarcation line, um, with later industrial use. And at the top end, trench four, um, we had archaeology over a thickness of two and a half meters. Um, and almost immediately we started to hit substantial stone structures, um, and which turned out to be the south and east uh, walls of a, of a clay wanded building. Um, with a cobbled area next to it, next to it that's the wall. Um, you can see the remains of the, <laughs> the remains of the cobbled area in here, and that's the edge of the wall. Um, so we, we probably had an outside courtyard heading out towards the high street with um, substantial stone footings 
next to it. Um, alongside, there was a path as well, alongside that we got some posts, so there was some sort of enclosure next to it. Um, and we also got uh, these rather nice shears, which are cloth shears really. Um, I don't know if you could shear a sheep with them, but it would be nice to tie them in with the enclosure, but anyway, uh, as an x-ray, that's what they look like. Um, so, we've got probably a 16th century building, and below that was, um, and, the, and the building extended into trench five, and below uh, the building itself, we were getting um, early wooden structures, posts, um, some door, there was a sill beam right at the bottom of trench four, quite well preserved. So we've got early and medieval use of, of the same site. Um, on, in this trench, we had what seemed to be an indoor floor surface with quite a lot of coal scattered about and a problem with nasty use. And below that, we had a path which extended underneath the wall, um, so from an earlier building. Um, and nicely, there was some uh, metalworking debris on it. So it's the Hammermen, proves it. They're everywhere. Well, they're, well, they're on this side. Um, so it, we do seem to have. Um, Uh, quite a, an intensive use of the site, um, particularly at the south end. And from here, we're also getting quite a lot of pottery. I'll just show you that before I move on. Um, here's, this is from Trench 4, it's from, it's from this nice jug. Um, quite a lot of, um, lo this is local red ware, but that's nice stuff really. Um, but as well as that, we were getting imported material. Oh, that's a nice little doggy. That's oh, Trench 4 as well. It's rather sweet, isn't it? Um, that's, that's Red Bird too. But um, we're also getting, that's a dripping pan. This is a Dutch dripping pan to show you what it might be, might look like. Um, but we're also getting stuff from uh, abroad. Um, that's a, um, that's a Siegberg uh, rim and handle, Siegberg uh, am Rhein, Germany. Um, and that's the job. We didn't get that. That's just to show you what it might have looked like if they had smashed it to pieces. Um, and this is a Raren or Festivald jug and all Raren in Belgium, Festivald on the Rhine as well. And this is all fairly high status stuff. Um, so we've got, uh, and again, we didn't get that. <laughs> um, so that's the theatre. And I'd better race on to the next site. Um, and you'll Forgotten all that by the time we come to the questioning, uh, and so will I. So we'll see how we get on. Anyway, um, I'll come out of that. The second site, totally unconnected. Come on. Um, is. Right. Oh, well, farm. Um, is it the tour? Um, just south of Lake Arrow, as you can see from that. A uh, very rich archaeological landscape. Um, there's a Roman signal station just very close to the site. Um, there's lots of things, but the, the main thing in the area is the Cleveland Dyke, um, which our next speaker, who will not be partially excavated, along with the uh, mortuary structure at Littler, or Plow, or Plow. Um, and uh, so, quite a prestigious area to be working in. So, of course, we were there because someone wanted to put a potato um, entirely out. Um, as well as the as Barclay Maxwell's work on the dike and the floor, um, we did a, an evaluation in 2011 nearby, which picked up an Iron Age settlement. Well, it was already known there was an Iron Age settlement, but we verified it almost certainly. Um, so there's quite a lot in the area. We had a good chance of finding something. Um, it was to the west of the farm, on fairly level ground. It was very cold to begin with. Um, this light woodland, the... Um, the signal station is actually just the back of those trees. And there was a, before we started, there was a track that ran right across the site and joined up with a 
an old military road, not a Wade road, it was a, a major coal field road, built in about 1760. Um, it's quite a gentle gradient, pretty much flat. Um, and more widely, it's on a plateau um, just above the River Isla and quite close to the confluence with the Tay. It's probably why the dikes there. Um, and there was a watching brief on the top soil. Uh, they opened up an 80 by 40 meter rectangle. Um, and typically nothing came up until the last day when the prehistoric pottery started appearing. So <coughs> we went to full excavation and we spent several days hoeing the site down. Uh, and there were about 116 different features, um, most of which turned out to be rabbit burrows and tree holes. Um, but 49 of them were anthropogenic, uh, like people. And they all cut into the natural, and they're almost all uh, hits, or possibly close holes in some cases. Um, and on the basis of um, initially pottery and lithics, 43 of them were prehistoric. We took soil samples from all of them, but it was agreed for financial reasons to only process about 10 percent. We, we did six of them in the end, plus another bit of charcoal. We found carbonized cereal grains across the whole site, although only in one feature were there more than one or two present. One feature was quite a lot. Um, the what? Right. Um, there's scatters of, of features, but as you can see, helpfully, the mostly clumping into clusters. Well done to the ancestors there. It's very helpful. Um, so we can go through them by cluster. In the northwest corner, there's these two larger pits and a little triangular arrangement. I mean, we can't assume that they're all contemporary, but they are quite nice little triangle. It's a bit shelter like. Um, from uh, the, the pits, uh, there's one of them. So it's quite dark, Phil. Um, like stony, there was a bit of pottery. The other one uh, probably was the same origin <coughs> originally, but uh, the bunnies decided to join in and uh, took totally the miners, so we couldn't really use any soil from that. But um, from both of them, we were getting early Neolithic pottery, um, and from the bunny one. Uh, we also got this crested piece, this is the, the top left one, the dinky little thing. Um, they do crop up in the Mesolithic, um, but because it was found with Neolithic pottery, probably early Neolithic. Um, so that's that corner. The northeast corner is quite a lot more things, um, very keen different features, most of them in this cluster. Uh, but in the far corner, the, the ground rose up a bit more, it's quite firm. And uh, there are a couple of pits, uh, one like, elongated like this, and the base is quite sort of intricate and scooped. Um, <coughs> other sites, such as um, Kinbichi on the Black Isle, which I haven't done, um, had dates from the early mid Neolithic. Um, and this sort of thing is categorized as a storage pit, possibly. Now, that, there is a live debate still about um, permanence versus transhumance or nomadism. Um, how settled were people? Did they really need storage pits? How effective would this have been for storing things? Um, sadly, the soil remains processed from that one. Um, I'm going to pass the hat round at the end to, <laughs> to fund all the first work we want to do. Um, but anyway, um, it may or may not contain cereal grains. Um, the other pit had, uh, was quite steep sided and had quite a braided uh, impressed where possibly. That's actually from a, a different feature, but it's nicer looking than what we got from that one. So, there um, Now, that, that's another live debate, really. Um, Impressed where it has been seen as sitting quite late in the Neolithic. Um, but Alice and Sheridan and, and others have, have suggested maybe mid to late fourth millennium, so quite early in the Neolithic. Um, but also <coughs> have suggested that Impressed where is possibly too broad a category to actually be meaningful. Um, it is quite relevant to the site actually for, for dating purposes and um, phasing. Um, because this 
in this cluster, there's sort of four corner uh, features, uh, a post hole. And it, it's quite tempting to speculate a structure into existence. And we could, oh, this is, this is a little house or something. It's got a four post hole. It's a watchtower. Who knows? Um, it's a bed. Um, but two of, two of the posts had early Neolithic pottery in them, and two of them had impressed work. Um, so it seemed to be different phases. <coughs> um, and that, we would like to know how far apart those phases are. The two earlier ones, and also this feature 43, where you can see it's, things have moved about a bit. The, the, the two earlier ones, which are 48 and 122, um, were recut. And if there was a post, it's the angle seems to have changed. So, is that it being converted from a three poster to a four poster? Um, well, we would like to know. Um, now, before I get on to the rest of the site, um, in, uh, in, in a master cluster, uh, in some of the post holes, well, one of the post holes in particular, we found this piece of stone which we thought was probably a quern stone or a piece of quern stone, which seemed to be being used as a post pad. Um, but it's actually much too fine grained, it's too smooth to be for grinding grain. Uh, Torben Barlin suggested it's actually a grinding slab um, for finishing an axe or something like that. Here's another one we got from uh, the middle of the site, which was found in two pieces and they fit together quite nice. And you can see that there's a bit of a scoop in there. So, uh, that's that's what Torben thinks they are, um, and certainly they do seem to be too smooth for for Um The interesting thing about them, one interesting thing, is that the parallels are in Norway, um, where they are Mesolithic. Um, and it doesn't mean that this is Mesolithic. Um, it could mean that uh, the, the use continues for for, for longer, um, but. It could alternatively be that there's, there has been Mesolithic occupation or visits to the site. There's been stuff flying around and people can use it. Um, now, um, dating. We got two dates from this part of the site from, from a couple of bolts. We've got some hazelwood um, from one of the small pits, um, which was 3552 to 3377 calibrated BC. And the older date is more probable. So about 3500 BC. Um, and then we got another one from this pit, pit 29, um, which again was around 3500 BC. So quite tightly dated. Um, and the two dates. Um, there, are, there are dates from the Mithra uh, mortuary structure from 3, 3650 BC, so possibly contemporary activity. Okay. Um, anyway, we'd like to process some more samples and tie that down a bit better. Um, pit 29, I'll just have to skip through. Um, we got some tools which seem to be placed in a, in a structured sort of deposit, quartz tools. Um, so, is this, a, is this a structured deposit or is it something like a cooking pit or a fire setting? Um, this is the pit that we got most of the cereal grains from, um, uh, naked barley and emma wheat mostly, and also a bit of flax. Um, Brophy and Noble have said structured deposition and rubbish disposal can look like the same thing, uh, a recent paper on the Scottish Neolithic. It could be that we've got an or what to us would seem like an ordinary activity that has ritual connotation, ritual aspects. It doesn't mean that that makes the pit ritual. But we did have some other pits in the south end of the site which clearly had uh, structured deposition of large pottery vessels that support in one of them. That's early Neolithic as well. Right, we'll jump to the middle of the site. Um, there was another type group. From this one pit, we got about 95% of the flint from the site. Um, the flint sounds about 300 different flakes and chips, 281 of which was a piece of debitage, nine causes and ten tools. And discounting the quartz from the north end of the site, where there wasn't any flint, well, not the northeast corner, anyway, it was all quartz, um, it was mostly from this pit and another one. Um, and about two thirds of it was Yorkshire flint, so it was imported. 
there was local stuff there as well. Um, that we were also getting grooved wear from this part of the site. Um, which the, the amount of debitage on these two features suggests um, that they were probably dug through a napping floor. And the, the pottery is broken into small sherds, possibly scattered about. Some of the other finds, like these scrapers, uh, had quite heavy um, use wear suggestive of vegetation processing. Um, so it looks like there's possibly some sort of domestic activity going on, but other things dug through it, um, slightly accelerating. Um, and south of that, we've got a pit alignment, um, pit or post hole, which are quite large pits. And you can see the base of this one is this um, charcoal deposit, um, which looked a bit like an in situ burning of a post. Possibly. This large piece of Yorkshire flint was stuck in the top of it. It looked almost as though it's been struck and on purpose just then and, and left to seal whatever this was. And there's the, the pit. Um, another pit in the middle had this, this deposit next to it, which had two uh, groove bowls with this nice little chevron design on it. Um, just to round off, we got a, a couple of features with Bronze Age material. Uh, only a couple, and one of them might have been a rabbit burrow, um, but it had quite a nice uh, Bronze Age urn, uh, part of it. Uh, now, um, there it is. The interesting thing about pottery, uh, the grooveware at least, is that it's not typical of, of Scotland, which is most uh, grooveware sites in Scotland of uh, woodlands or Cadian type um, grooveware. This is Durrington Walls. Um, it's the same sort of stuff that's found um, at the type site with Darrington Walls, which is, I'm sure you know, is basically this construction compound for uh, Stonehenge. I was reading quite an interesting article. Um, Structure analysis of animals at Durrington uh, found that some had come from northeast Scotland. So I'm just saying, um, because we've got, not only have we got the Yorkshire flint, which is not totally unusual, it doesn't appear at this time in Scotland, but it's imported. And we've got this slightly alien pottery type. It looks a bit like, without sounding too Gordon Child, it looks a bit like a package. Um, does this mean some sort of direct contact between uh, the South, um, maybe even Stonehenge? Um, so, a direct contact between the Dyke uh, area and Yorkshire, <laughs> uh, or possibly even the West Country. <laughs> so, sorry, I had to race through that last bit. But uh, any questions? Um, sorry, skip the questions. I'm afraid we're running overhead. But well, we should be time possibly before the, re the refreshments. Come okay. Up, or lunchtime. We'll take the, take the questions. So, um, I'd like to invite Gordon to. Uh,